a second. Okay. Um, so first, uh, thank you, Yuri, for the nice talk. And also thank you uh, to the organizers um, for the invitation to give this talk. So I'm going to be talking about um, neutron stars as axion laboratories in two different contexts, both in terms of uh, searches for axions using neutron stars in x-rays and also searches uh, using radio data. Both will be astrophysical searches. And um, these are two different sets of projects, um, but using the same objects and looking for the same physics. So there are many people who contributed to these projects. I just want to acknowledge some of my junior collaborators. Uh, Malta Bushman and Raymond Coe are my postdocs here in Michigan. Uh, Chris Desert and Josh Foster are my grad students here. Andrew Long was a postdoc at Michigan, now on the faculty at Rice. And Ji Chen Soon uh, was an undergrad at Michigan, now a grad student at MIT. And by the way, um, if you have uh, questions as we go along, uh, please feel free to uh, interrupt me and just uh, unmute your microphone and ask them. Okay, so I'm gonna be focusing on um, indirect searches for axions and axion-like particles. This should be contrasted with much of what Yuri was talking about. Um, and I'm gonna be looking for these ultra-light axions and, and ALPs. So when we talk about these particles, um, it's maybe more familiar to be thinking about direct detection experiments and look for these as dark matter, such as the ABMX or Abracadabra, which are which shown here at the bottom. But I wanna to try to convince you today that indirect searches, in particular in the X-ray and radio bands, can play a, an important role in covering um, the possible parameter space where new physics could show up. So why am I using neutron stars? The key reason that I'm gonna be thinking about neutron stars is that neutron stars have really strong magnetic fields and axions can convert into photons in the presence of magnetic fields. So neutron stars have the strongest stable magnetic fields in the universe. Magnetic fields on the order of 10 to 14 Gauss are stronger. Um, and this allows uh, axions to convert into, um, into photons at a relatively high rate. So, I'm going to be talking about axions and radio essentially because there's two different sources of axions that you can imagine which would interact with this magnetic field. Maybe the more straightforward version are, would be the axions which are produced within the star itself. So the neutron star has a, a thermal plasma in, in the core and this thermal plasma can produce axions thermally. These would be produced at the temperature of the core, energies of around 10 keV. They would leave the star due to their weak interactions and they could then convert into photons in the external magnetic field. And this would produce a broad spectrum, a roughly thermal spectrum of X-ray photons that we can go and look for. And that's gonna be the basis behind uh, part of this talk. But then if you just kind of brainstorm, what other sources of axions could there be which could interact with this magnetic field? Another source of axions could be dark matter axions, of axions make up a fraction of the dark matter that could be pulled in towards the neutron star just based off of gravity. And then they're gonna still hit this magnetic field. They can convert into photons, but now the photons will show up in radio because they're lower frequency because energy is conserved in this process. But they're also gonna be roughly monochromatic because in this case, the axions are non-relativistic, at least semi-relativistic. So uh, the frequency of these photons is just gonna be set by the mass of the axions. And this will form the basis behind the first search that I'm gonna tell you about today. Okay, so you already went over the effect of Lagrangian when we talk about ALPs and axion-like particles. Here are the relevant terms that I'm gonna be focusing on. So for part of this talk, when I talk about the thermal production, I will be mentioning possible derivative couplings of the axions to quarks, which were just reviewed. And throughout this whole talk, I'm gonna be focusing on the axion-photon interaction a F F tilde, where F is the QED field strength, A is the axion field. And there's some dimensionful coupling Ga gamma gamma. And this plot shows you the current constraints on this Ga gamma gamma, units of inverse GeV, as a function of the axion mass. And as you already reviewed, for the QCD axion, the axion which couples also to the QCD Lagrangian, then there is essentially a one-to-one -one relationship between the axion mass and the coupling which means that the QCD axion should roughly live within this yellow band. 
So if you go outside of this yellow band, meaning you violate this mass coupling relation, now you're in the parameter space of axion-like particles, which means that your axion-like particle probably does not couple with QCD, but there's still no reason that it couldn't exist. So we want to try to cover this entire parameter space. And when we talk about ALPS, um, it's, it, you might wonder what is the motivated parameter space when we give up on the requirement that, this is the, that we're looking for the QCD axion. And there's some interesting work coming out of this, the string theory community who are looking at explicit constructions, which can give, uh, which give rise to uh, large numbers of these ALPS. I just want to highlight one recent paper which found, at least within the context of their specific construction, that the most strongly coupled ALP could be relatively strongly coupled with a coupling on the order of 10 to minus 12, 10 to minus 10 inverse GV uh, for ultra low axion masses, which, I mean, this is just a model, but still it motivates um, trying to push down these couplings even incrementally uh, beyond where they are now. Um, and that's going to be the philosophy behind this work is how can we push down uh, sensitivity using astrophysical observations of neutron stars even incrementally versus what's, um, what's currently here. So with that said, here's roughly the regions of the parameter space that I'm going to attempt to cover today. So for the radio part of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on axion dark matter, and I'm going to be trying to cover the parameter space, which is roughly outlined here in blue. And the goal of this, um, of this project in general is going to be to eventually push ourselves all the way down to probe QCD axion dark matter. But for the X-ray part of the talk, when I'm going to be talking about axions produced within the cores of the neutron stars themselves, the goal is going to be to probe these axion-like particles, not necessarily as dark matter candidates, but just as particles within the spectrum of nature, and to push down the sensitivity for low mass uh, axions. So before I tell you about, um, about our work, I want to um, go over at least one of the constraints which which is on this figure because it'll help understand some of the basic physics that'll be useful when we do talk about neutron stars. So I wanna briefly uh, explain where this limit in blue comes from, which is from the CAST experiment. So the first step to doing that is to understand what is the actual fundamental physics process that's going on here. So what, at what um, CAST is doing, which is the same thing that all of these experiments uh, are doing, is to use the axion-photon interaction to convert an axion in the presence of a strong magnetic field into a photon. And you can see this from the Lagrangian. If we take the magnetic field, this is the AFF tilde written in terms of electric and magnetic fields. If we take B to be an external magnetic field, we have an incoming axion which rotates into a photon, polarized along the magnetic field. The conversion probability for this process needs to have a B squared in it, needs to have a G a gamma gamma squared, and then just to make up the dimensions, there needs to be something with the units of length. And that L is the difference between experiments, because L is just going to be determined by whatever is in your actual laboratory or problem, which has units of length, which could be the geometry of the magnetic field, along with the axion wavelength itself, which has units of length. So what are these, what is the value of this L for a cast? So what is cast doing? Cast is looking for axions or axion-like particles produced within the core of the sun, which escape the sun, they're relativistic, they hit the cast experiment, which has a strong magnetic field, they're converted to x-rays, picked up with x-ray optics. So what is L in this case? So this is a bit of a non-trivial question because the axion and the photon have to have the same energy before and after the conversion process, because energy is conserved, but they have different dispersion relations because the axion has a mass and the photon uh, doesn't have a mass. So there's a momentum mismatch. And if this momentum mismatch is really small, that is, we don't even notice it over the length scale of cast, then the length scale we take is the length scale of cast, and we're happy because that's the biggest scale in the problem. But as we increase the axion mass, the momentum mismatch becomes bigger, and eventually we start to notice it over the length scale of cast. And then it turns out for the conversion probability, you should take the length scale is the inverse momentum mismatch scale, which is smaller than cast, and now we're sad because we have to square this thing. And now we see that our con conversion probability drops off as a function of increasing mass. So we go back to this figure, we can now understand its shape. The limit is flat at low masses because we don't even notice the axion has a mass because it's relativistic. But as we go to higher masses, we start to notice this momentum mismatch. So you might be wondering what is going on here with all these jagged points. 
What's going on there is that the cast people, of course, know about this. They're smart people. So what they do is simply to give the photon a mass. They inject a plasma into the magnetic field region, adjust the pressure to adjust the plasma frequency, and then they can scan over possible photon masses. And if the axion mass equals the photon mass, now you suddenly match the dispersion relations again, and you can have resonant conversion. So this is going to play a key role. This idea of giving the photon a mass will play a key role in the first part of my talk, which is on radio searches for axion dark matter, uh, where the axion is the, the dark matter. So the reason is the following. The neutron star, in addition to giving us a magnetic field, also gives us a photon mass. And the reason is there's a plasma that's relatively well understood outside of the neutron star. And this plasma gives the photon a mass through the plasma mass. And even in, you can see it in this artistic rendition, there's simply more stuff near the neutron star surface, which means that the photon mass is going to monotonically increase as you approach the neutron star surface. So what this means is we have our dark matter, which is falling in towards the neutron star. And it wants to convert, but it can't convert efficiently to photons because it has a different dispersion relation from the photon until it reaches the radius where the axion mass equals the photon mass. At this radius, we get resonant conversion into photons. So what does this mean? Normally, the conversion probability in the non-resonant case, the length scale we'd want to take would be the inverse um, mass of the axion, the axion wavelength, which is quite small. But in the resonant regime, if you work out the calculation, which I'm not going to go through, it turns out the relevant length scale is actually the geometric mean of that small scale with roughly the size of the magnetic field region, the size of the neutron star, which is very big. So this increases the, co the, the conversion probability by quite a lot. And then outgoing from here, we're going to have radio emission, which is going to be at the uh, frequency uh, corresponding to the mass of the axion. So, um, so this gives you a narrow signal. It's the, the frequency of the signal is essentially set by the axion mass plus small kinetic corrections coming from the fact that the energy of the axion is not completely the mass. There is some kinetic motion as well. But essentially, it's a very narrow signal. And then those radio waves will propagate through the cosmos, and we have some hope of looking for them with our radio telescopes here on Earth. So um, over the past few years, my group has been developing a lot of the theory behind how you actually go about um, calculating this process, uh, the, the, the rates from this process. But what I want to tell you about very briefly is some exciting results which appeared uh, recently in early 2020, where we actually went out and acquired data um, to look for this process to see if it's going on in nature. So this is data we collected and analyzed from the Green Bank Telescope in the US and the Eppelsberg Telescope uh, in Germany uh, with this list of people. And we were probing roughly, as I'll show you, this region of mass space shown here in red. Um, this is a motivated region of parameter space if we can eventually get down to the QCD axion because this is, there's a, a lot of good reason to think that the QCD axion as dark matter might be uh, in this space. For example, uh, some recent work of, of mine uh, and also others have had similar results have suggested that a 25 micro EV axion uh, could explain the abundance of dark matter um, if the Petchy Quinn symmetry is broken after inflation. So we're going to be below this 25 micro EV scale, but we're going to be uh, inching on up to it. So here, uh, I'm going to go over this rather quickly, um, but here's an uh, illustration of the data that we actually collected and, and processed. Um, I'm showing you just a fraction of the data um, towards some different targets. But first, on the y-axis is the flux density. This is the strength of the, uh, of the flux that we observed as a function of the frequency of the radiation on the x-axis, as was observed by the telescope. So the, black, the red and blue curves here these are data from the Green Bank Telescope uh, in the US um, towards two nearby isolated neutron stars. These are neutron stars that we understand very well. They're within a few hundred, kilopar a few hundred parsec of the sun. Uh, they're in our local neighborhood. We know the dark matter density and their vicinities. Um, we also know their magnetic fields and their magnetospheres quite well. So, um, so that's this data. In black um, is something different. This is data we took from the Effelsberg Telescope for this search, we simply pointed the telescope at the galactic center. Um, here, we're not looking at a specific neutron star. Rather, we're looking at that whole population of neutron stars in the inner galaxy, which could all be emitting at the same frequency, the frequency corresponding to the axion. 
uh, maps. So this, as I'll discuss on the next slide, there's a lot more uncertainties, theoretical uncertainties, which come into play when we're analyzing the data shown here in black. So what do we actually do in the analysis? I'm gonna skip over the details, but what we do is we do a bump hunt. Uh, our signal is expected to be incredibly narrow on top of the data as shown here, which is at frequencies of a gigahertz. The data, the signals we're looking for have uh, widths on the order of one to 10 kilohertz. So we do a bump hunt in a sliding window, and it might look like there are spikes all over the place, but actually most of these spikes are much bigger than, uh, than a kilohertz or 10 kilohertz. We also have off data, meaning we look at the source we care about, and then we switch periodically to a random part of the sky, and we switch back on, and if we see a signal, it can't appear in the off data also, otherwise we veto it, which means it's some sort of radio frequency interference. So after we do this on-off switching, do this bump hunt, we actually find no evidence for axion signals, which might sound obvious to you, but it wasn't obvious to us because that means our data analysis is actually working. So the data is consistent with the null hypothesis, uh, which is reassuring. It means that this technique at uh, statistics and the observational level um, is, is actually promising. So then these are the limits that we produce on um, GA gamma gamma as a function of the axion mass. So the colored curves up here, these are the same ones that I was describing. These are the limits that we get by looking at the nearby isolated neutron stars. The theoretical uncertainties on these curves are, are relatively small. This should be contrasted with the limit that's shown in black, where the theoretical uncertainties are much larger. This is from our population search with the Applesberg telescope. So the central limit here, this comes from taking, uh, assuming the NFW dark matter profile all the way down to essentially one parsec. Um, if we instead were to core the dark matter density profile at one kiloparsec, this limit would go up to what's shown at the top of this green band. So that uncertainty gives you a sense of the uncertainty from the dark matter density profile in the inner galaxy. If um, we also have to assume, make assumptions about the neutron star population. If we assume uh, here we've taken a conservative population uh, where we essentially assume the only neutron stars which participate are the ones which we actively have studied, um, but there should be more neutron stars than the ones we have studied, old neutron stars. If we uh, model them in a more optimistic way, the limit could become much stronger by about an order of a magnitude and a half, all the way down to what's shown at the bottom of the screen band. So there's a lot of uncertainties when you talk about these population searches. Um, so the dominant uncertainties are the pop, and, and I'm mentioning these because I think these are very good um, subjects to try to, uh, to, to try to nail down. These are all, I think, um, the, these can all be, uh, the, the uncertainties related to all these things can be reduced. So uh, the population model systematic is a big uncertainty uh, when we talk about searching for these populations. Uh, what are the properties of neutron star populations? Another big uncertainty, which is a bit harder to know how to go after, is uh, what is the dark matter density profile in the very inner region of the galaxy? Uh, this plays an important role. There's also a set of uncertainties, which I haven't even mentioned, related to modeling the magnetospheres. For these nearby isolated neutron stars, we understand their magnetospheres pretty well. But for some of these other neutron stars, younger neutron stars, uh, the magnetospheres are understood less well. And we've had to make assumptions, which bring in uncertainties. Um, and then there's even uncertainties related to how we go about calculating the signal itself. Uh, essentially, everyone to date has used simplified versions of this conversion process. Uh, and I think our full 3D simulation of axion dark matter falling onto the neutron star, converting and propagating out. That's not currently available, and that would be very useful for better interpreting the, this data. Hello, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Um, for this galaxy, uh, for this galaxy center neutron stars, you, uh, you know there are a lot of material between us and the galaxy center, which will result in uh, dispersion and scattering of radio signals. So, how do you account for these uncertainties? Yeah, that's a good question. So the neutron stars which are producing the emission that we're modeling here, the, um, the attenuation of the signal is actually relatively small, the predicted attenuation. Um, you, and, the, and there is no, we're not looking for anything in the time domain. So the, the normal thing you'd think about for, a, for material on a pulsar, for example, would be the dispersion measure, or how do signals get smeared out, and time is a function of frequency. 
But our signal is monochromatic, and, and at least at the level of this search, we're not actually looking for anything in the time domain. So, the, so really the dominant thing you have to worry about is the attenuation, which is predicted to be relatively small at these frequencies for sources this close to the galactic center. But it's certainly something that we've thought about. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so, um, so where do we want to go in the future here? Um, the, the first place uh, that we would like to, um, to go is uh, down, um, well, just to get more data. So, um, so we're thinking ahead to SKA, Square Kilometer Array, which is a bigger telescope, better spatial information, um, and uh, a rough projection with 100 hours of SKA data could get us somewhere down to green, maybe even better if we do a more sophisticated data analysis. Uh, and we have data already on the MWA telescope array, which is kind of a precursor to SKA, uh, which will allow us at least to get our data analysis framework in place so we're, we're ready to go uh, when SKA eventually does come online. In the meantime, um, we're working to acquire more data in, in conjunction, for example, with the group in, in Stockholm to, um, to just expand the frequency range with, for example, GBT data so that we can get all the way up, for example, to 25 micro EV. Um, which, which is uh, another part of this, uh, another goal of this project. Okay, so there's a lot more to say there, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move on, switch gears, and, and talk about the other way that we have to look for axions and axion-like particles from these objects, which is looking in x-rays um, for axions not as dark matter, but axions which are produced within the cores of, of the neutron stars. So, Ben, uh, more, 10 minutes, more or less. Okay, great, thanks. So when I talk about the production of the axions, I now have to produce the axions inside of the neutron star. The conversion process is very similar to in the dark matter case. So the, um, the neutron, neutron stars mostly have nucleons, such as neutrons. So the dominant production mode, if the axion couples derivatively to quarks, would be, for example, brimming off an axion and the final state from nucleon, nucleon scattering. So you have two neutrons scattered, exchanging a pion within the degenerate neutron star. They brim off an axion in the final state. This requires a coupling of the axion to nucleons or a coupling of the axion to quarks. That axion escapes, converts into a photon, which can be picked up with our X-ray telescopes in this case, not radio telescopes. So the whole reason why this process might work is that um, the core of a neutron star is thermally insulated from the surface. Surface temperatures might be on the order of 100 EV, whereas the core temperatures are on the order of 10 keV. So that means that the photons, which would come from axions, would be much hotter than the photons coming from the surface. So if axions exist within the spectrum of nature, we might expect to see something like the following spectrum when we look at a neutron star. In blue, I'm showing you the thermal surface emission, uh, just the, the surface cooling down. And then in red is what we'd expect from the axion-induced signal. So uh, this is a signal with a, a temperature of about 10 keV, so it would eventually turn over, but I've cut this plot off at 10 keV for reasons which will become clear in a second. So we're going to be looking for this hard X-ray signal from nearby isolated neutron stars. So I'm not going to go through, just for the sake of time, the details of how you actually go about calculating this signal, but let me just um, uh, tell you some of the ingredients you need if you want to do this. So first, at the level of the Lagrangian, as I've already mentioned, we're going to require derivative couplings of the axion to quarks in order to actually produce that axion or axion-like particle within the neutron star. Then to convert the axion or axion-like particle, we need a coupling of the axion to uh, electric and magnetic fields. The predicted spectrum of x-rays that you get out of this should be roughly thermal at the core temperature of the neutron star, which I'm denoting here by TB infinity. The infinity means it's the redshifted core temperature after you do the gravitational redshift to infinitely far away from the neutron star's gravitational potential. So it should be roughly thermal, although there are some modifications to the spectrum, which come from um, uh, energy dependence of the conversion probability itself. To calculate the production, you need to know the neutron star equation of state. That brings in immediately some level of theoretical uncertainty. You also need to know uh, what is going on in terms of possible nucleon superfluidity, such as nucleon superfluid transition temperatures, which brings in another level of uh, theoretical uncertainty. Um, 
you also need to know the magnetic fields. These, however, are well measured for the neutron stars that we care about. So while the shape of this spectrum is relatively straightforward to compute, the overall normalization of uh, the intensity um, has a lot of theoretical uncertainty related to it. So luckily, we have data that we could go ahead and right away and analyze to look for the signal. Uh, we looked at data from seven nearby neutron stars called the Magnificent Seven. These were discovered in the 90s with the ROSAT Full Sky X-ray Survey from their lower energy thermal emission. Um, they all have relatively strong magnetic fields, about 10 to 13 Gauss. Uh, and most importantly for this talk, they've only ever been observed in the thermal surface emission. So these things are just sitting there radiating from their, thermo their surfaces as black bodies, no non-thermal emission, at least before our work, no emission above 1 keV. In particular, no radio emission was ever detected. So we have data from two telescopes, Chandra and Exum Newton. These are very well-studied neutron stars for the lower energy data. But while people have collected data for decades on these neutron stars, as far as we are aware, we are the first people to just open up those data sets and look at the data above about 1 keV. So we were using archival data from 2 to 8 keV to look for these hard X-ray uh, signals. And we have two um, instruments, Chandra and Exum and Newton. We actually have three instruments. We have, there's two cameras that we use on board Exum and Newton. Uh, these have different advantages. The, the main advantage, which I'll, I'll point out just right now, is that Chandra has better angular resolution, which is useful if you're looking for a point source. So here is what we find for one of these neutron stars. The J1856, it's about 100 parsec away from the Earth. So here at low energies, this is DFD is a function of energy. You can see the thermal spectrum that we observed from this neutron star. I'm showing you at the data points from all three cameras. This is consistent with previous observations. This is just the thermal emission coming off the surface. The surprising thing was we do actually observe hard X-ray emission uh, coming from, these neutron, from this neutron star. Uh, we observe it with all three cameras at relatively high significance. And that's what I want to discuss in my last few minutes. So here's an image of the data in some appropriate units for J1856. This is the Chandra data. And you, from 2 to 8 keV, you can see pretty clearly that there's something going on at the location of this uh, neutron star. So with Chandra data only, there's about three sigma evidence for 2 to 8 keV flux. From PN data only on Exum Newton, there's about four sigma evidence for 2 to 8 keV flux. And the MOS camera, which has the least amount of exposure time, has about one sigma evidence. We then find similar excesses in four of the seven magnificent seven neutron stars. The other three are consistent with the null hypothesis. So very quickly, does the Axion model fit the data? Um, well, the first thing you can look at is the spectral shape. So here's the joint uh, spectral, um, the joint spectra uh, as measured by T and Moss and Chandra for J1856 in black. And overlaid in gray is the predicted spectral shape from our Axion model. So I guess, I mean, it looks roughly consistent. Maybe it's not the most constraining thing in the world, but it looks roughly consistent, the spectral shape. What about the intensities? Is it consistent that we observe the, um, this, these excesses and for the seven, magnificent seven? The short answer to this is yes. The longer answer is yes, but that's not actually a very constraining question because there's so much theoretical uncertainty on the actual predictions of the intensities themselves. So if you look at this best fit parameter space um, in the axion uh, coupling plane, uh, you find this region down here in red. So this is the combination of the axion neutron coupling times the axion photon coupling is a function of the axion mass and EV. So the one and two sigma regions are shown uh, here. These are dominated by uh, theoretical uh, systematic uncertainties. So we're below the current best constraints from past to neutron star pooling on this parameter space. At a statistical level, it's clear that what we're seeing is not a statistical fluctuation. That's not really the relevant question here. The relevant question, I think, to ask is, what about instrumental systematics and what about other astrophysical emission processes? Instrumental systematics, we've thought about a lot. I think those aren't likely playing an important role, although it'd be good to revisit that. Other astrophysical emission mechanisms, I think, as is always the case for indirect searches, um, for new physics, I think is really the, the important thing to be talking about. So very quickly to finish up, is there another explanation? Um, here's what we've thought of. Maybe it's a, there's a more complicated atmosphere model. The surface isn't radiating as a perfect black body, but something more complicated. At least as far as we've looked at that, it's very hard to have an atmosphere model or a surface emission model, which 
gets energy, uh, which gets non-trivial amount of energy above 2 keV. So maybe this could work, but we haven't been able to get such models to work. Maybe these neutron stars are secretly, they're, they're thought to be essentially dead neutron stars, they're not pulsars, but maybe they're secretly pulsars with jets pointed away from us, but some of that non-thermal emission is still getting to us. One issue there is these pulsars are spinning down very slowly, which means the non-thermal emission from a pulsar jet, even if one were to exist, is predicted to be very low. So the luminosities we observe appear to be too high, much too high, to be coming from pulsar jets. Maybe where these neutron stars are accreting the interstellar medium, heating up an accretion disk, which is radiating and hard x-rays, um, again, the energetics argument doesn't seem to work there, although maybe that can be uh, made to work. So the quick summary is, we, we, for the x-rays, we find this hard x-ray, we haven't found a convincing astrophysical explanation, but in my opinion, that's most likely, most likely, in my opinion, it's just an astrophysical explanation which we haven't thought of yet. But we do have near-term work to test the axion hypothesis. We're simply acquiring more data from more targets. Um, this parameter space will be probed by, in the laboratory by experiments such as IAXO, ALPS2. Um, and on terms of the theory side, um, kind of the model building side, I think it'd be interesting to think well, both in the context of this excess and more generally for neutron stars, what about other models, dark photons, neutrinos with non-standard interactions? Um, what else can be probed by these, um, by, by neutron stars? And potentially what else could be explaining this um, excess? Along those lines, we haven't modeled the inner core of the neutron star when we do the axion production, which has a lot of exotic matter, um, uh, potentially quark lone plasma, strange matter, muons, which could be contributing to this process as well. We just haven't considered this. So thanks. Any questions? Thank you very much, Ben. So please. Uh... Yes, so do you hear me? Yeah. OK. So you say that you observed excess uh, on four neutron stars out, out of seven. Under the hypothesis that this is an axon effect, do you have an explanation for that? Yeah, um, so the, the, different, uh, the different neutron stars, let me, let me first explain this in words and I can show you a figure if that's not sufficient. So uh, first there are trivial things. Some of these neutron stars have gotten 20 times more exposure time than other neutron stars, meaning the telescopes just looked at them less. So the neutron star where we see the most significant signal is the one that has been observed for the longest time. Um, so that's a trivial thing. Another trivial point is that some of these neutron stars are closer to the Earth than other neutron stars. The neutron star where we see the biggest signal is again the neutron star which happens to be closest to Earth. Um, that actually gets more complicated because while some of these neutron stars, their distances are known to 10% or smaller accuracy, other neutron stars, the distances are completely unknown at present. Uh, well, at least the uncertainties are very large. Then to calculate the luminosity, you also need to know the core temperatures of these neutron stars, which we can infer from their surface temperatures in using models which relate the surface temperature to the core temperature. But there are uncertainties which enter into that relationship as well. So uh, this is why I'm saying yes, it's consistent in the sense that, um, that when we account for all of the uncertainties, we don't find any tension uh, between, it, it, between the fact that we see this in four and not in three. But the uncertainties are so large that it's not really a very constraining statement. Um, so to, to answer your question at a really non-trivial level, I think there would need to be more work to shrink those uncertainties, which would include trivial things like measuring the distances to some of these neutron stars better, maybe acquiring more statistics just by pointing the telescopes back at some of these neutron stars to, um, you know, for those three, they happen to have very low statistics, so just acquire more statistics. Uh, and also to try to understand at a, at a modeling level uh, how can we, for example, better infer the core temperature, uh, better constrain the equation of state. So, um, so we've done the best we can with the data and the models we have available to us, but um, unfortunately I can't give you a very strong answer to that question. Okay, thanks. Okay, so there are three questions in the order. Tim Linden, please. Uh, yeah, hey Ben, uh, nice talk. Um, what is the best constraint on these being in some loosely bound binary? or some other system that can, you know, be pushing some extra accretion onto the system? 
Yeah, so um, so these these seven magnificent seven again, they're, they're rather special in that they're the seven neutron stars that we know of, which have only been detected by their thermal um, their thermal uh, X ray emission. So th they haven't been seen non thermally in any other system. There there's also timing um, information available for all of these from the fact that their magnetic fields are slightly misaligned, which means they have slightly asymmetric, well, they have, they have slightly asymmetric surface temperatures, and you can actually resolve the, the timing of them. You can see the spin down. So I think in the presence of a binary, all of these things would be slightly modified. Um, the spectrum away from thermal and uh, the timing of the neutron star. Um, so my feeling is, plus the fact that it would just be unlikely that the seven neutron stars we would see thermally would all have binaries, or at least four of the seven would have binaries. Um, they've also been observed in, in many other wavelengths, too, uh, and no companion has been seen. So there is a lot of work that's, been, that's gone into to seeing, to studying these objects across a range of wavelengths. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, there's no evidence for them being in binaries, and that would be pretty unlikely. Um, but Maybe I might be missing something there. Right. So there's Yure. Hey. And a question. So I have a question about your radio uh, bounds from the radio emission. Mm -hmm. So if you, so there, I mean, you talked about the interpretation, uh, uh, the errors in terms of interpreting uh, on the scale, but ex just observationally, uh, to push down the the limits is just more observational time or there's some inherent because um, you do a bump hunt the energy resolution is important and so on so wh where does this enter yeah so um so observationally you can ask yeah so, so let me just tell you how we how we do this analysis we did this narrow sliding window we um and we look for a bump over the data but we estimate the variance in the data from the sidebands in that bump hunt. Um, so you can ask, how is that variance in the data? How consistent is that with the expectation um, under the null hypothesis, or the expectation before we went it, we went and even did the search? Sorry, not under the null hypothesis, but just the expectation from thermal noise in the telescope. And so that's what's shown here with these solid lines. These are showing you the expected sensitivity before we even did the search. Um, and you can see for the Eppelsberg searches, we're pretty close to the expectations. But for these isolated neutron stars, there is a, a bit of a systematic discrepancy between the expected sensitivity and the observed sensitivity. This still, we were still able to do our bump hunt because we determined this variance in a data-driven way. But it meant that the sensitivity wasn't as good as it should have been. Um, and we're not completely sure for the reasons for all of this discrepancy. So when I was making these projections, I was assuming that this discrepancy would persist. But uh, you can also see in these isolated neutron stars, it kind of looks like it's getting better with frequency. So maybe by the time we get all the way up to up here, which is kind of 25 micro UV, that some of these systematics have gotten better. That seems to also roughly to be, be the case, except for at some specific frequency points uh, for Applesberg data. But that's certainly something to um, think about. I mean, I, I think there's improvements that could come on the data analysis side as well. Um, but uh, so, so I guess you don't even know how this systematic scares with more, like if you had uh, 10 times more observational time on the neutron stars, you don't know what would happen to this systematic. Is this right? We, we do know that to some extent uh -huh. because we can see how they're, how things are scaling as we look at subsets of our data. So how do they scale? And, and the, the Effelsberg data is really scaling like the noise. So, so th these data sets are scaling like the noise. It's possible that if, when we get to some point, they'll stop. But for the moment, they're scaling like thermal noise should scale. And you can see that the magnitude is- And the GBT? The, the GBT the, data um, is, uh, is not scaling exactly like we would have hoped it would scale. Um, so in that case, um, yeah, it, it's unclear what more observation time would do. Um, I should say one hope when, I, when we're going to, um, uh, but, but that's 
something we're actively studying, and again, we're acquiring more data. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll know this, we'll have better answers to that soon. But when I talk about going to SKA, one really nice thing here is that we have a completely different way of actually doing the data analysis, and that we now also have spatial information. So GBT and Effelsberg, these are single dishes. They just report a flux value and a frequency. Uh, that's all we have. We have no spatial information. SKA or the MWA, these are arrays. They give you a pixelated image and frequency space across the sky. So then you can not only do a bump hunt, but you can do a spatial bump hunt because we're looking for individual objects in the sky, which are bright at single frequencies. Um, so that's a whole different observational handle that we have in order to, uh, to, to search for these signals. It also complicates the data analysis, which is why we're, why we're focusing on analyzing this MWA data as well. But that gives us an additional handle, which will probably be useful when pushing down the sensitivity. That's why I was saying that this scaling is assuming everything just goes through as it is for GB, as for, it is for Applesburg, but, um, but it could be the case that it, it actually scales better than that. Thanks. Yeah. Right. So Keisuke had the question. Uh, yes. In the second part of the talk, so you consider production of action by the coupling with nucleon. So could you tell me what happened if you try to explain the hard photon, hard, hard X-ray excess by the production by coupling with electron or photons? Is that killed by cast? Yeah, so the, the photon case is hard. The reason it's hard is that the, uh, the, the thermal mass of the photon is just so high um, that it, um, it's, it's higher than the temperature, I believe. So, uh, so you just can't, you can't produce the photons. Um, so you, you, can't produce the, you can't produce the axion inside the neutron star cores through an axion photon coupling directly. This is true not just for neutron stars, but for many, um, for many of these dense systems where the plasma frequency is just so high uh, because there's, there's so much stuff in, in, in a small amount of space. The electron coupling question is interesting. Uh, and I think this is a question which, which deserves more thought. We've thought about it a little bit because there are electrons within these systems as well. Um, they're degenerate electrons. However, the nucleon scattering does happen uh, with a higher rate than the electron scattering um, because uh, one is exchanging a pion versus the other one, which is exchanging a photon. Um, so, so just from that, it seems like the rate for nucleon scattering is higher, but it's possible that if there is only a coupling to electrons, for example, that you could produce the, you could explain this through an electron coupling. Um, another possibility, just going along with what you're saying is muons because there is a non-trivial trivial muon thermal momentum, at least it is expected to be one within neutron stars. So you could also be producing these two muons. When we did a back of the envelope estimate for this, it seemed like um, the, again, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're, that would naively be subdominant compared to the nucleon scattering because the, the primary scattering is, ex, is electromagnetic instead of through a pion exchange. Um, but if you, if you only, for example, couple the leptons, you don't couple the quarks, and that's, that's what you have to do. Um, in that case, I think it's for sure that you would be above current constraints um, if you were to explain it through, for example, muon production. Um, but uh, we haven't worked out the details of that very precisely. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So I don't see other questions, but in case you have a very last question. Now is the time. Okay, nothing. So I thank both uh, you and Ben for two very nice talks. And uh, next week we have uh, the sitter. <laughs>